Today's readings are from Isaiah 55 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you want to follow the church Bibles, it's on pages 742 and 1197. Come, all you, who, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no mercy, no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk, without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread, and your labour on what does, does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest fare. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will, you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do know not, you do not know, will come running to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord where he may be found, and call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, and the unrighteous, the unrighteous their thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither, of your, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And now we move to Timothy 3. But as for you, continue what you have learned and have become convinced of it because you know from those whom you learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which you are able to make, to make you wise for the salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, so to suit their, desire, their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations Endure hardship and do the work of an evangelist. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. This is the word of the Lord. Hello. Good morning to everybody who's watching uh, on, on the computer link and those who are watching in the future. It's really good to be here this morning. Father, 
We thank you for your word, for its power, for its truth, for its strength, for its ability to change lives, for its ability to teach us how to be forgiven and to come to know you as our Lord and Saviour. We pray this morning that you'll help us to understand it better through my words and by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I've been given two passages for Bible Sunday, both of which emphasize the importance of the Word of God, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. And they emphasize particularly two very important ways in which the Word of God assists us, and I'm going to look at these. In so doing, I'm going to look at the other major themes of these passages, and next I will look at the relationship between God's words, what God says, and the Scriptures. After that, I look briefly at the way in which the Old Testament should be interpreted in the light of the New Testament, and finally, as time allows, I look at some of the ways in which Christians can misunderstand the Scriptures, and particularly the Old Testament. So I haven't set myself much of a task this morning, really, have I? <laughs> but the first main theme, salvation through faith by grace. The opening verses of Isaiah 55 are an invitation to the spiritually thirsty to come to the spiritual waters. The invitation is to those who have no money, nothing to give. And the promise is that they will be able to buy wine and milk and it won't cost them anything. This is a lovely picture of the grace of God given to us through our Lord Jesus Christ. God who has made provision for all our spiritual needs. The readers are told to stop spending their money on things which don't satisfy, but instead to come to the Lord God where they will receive everything that they need and their souls will live. And the Lord God also promises to make an everlasting covenant with them, a covenant like the one he made with King David. And to make it clear what they must do, in verse 6, the Lord God calls upon them to seek him while he may be found, to call upon him while he is near, to put aside wicked ways and wicked thoughts, and to turn to him who will have mercy on them, and to the Lord God who will freely pardon. So, this is saying plainly that there is a need for seeking God, repenting, and asking for forgiveness and mercy. Well, how are we to understand this? Remember, this is an Old Testament passage, although it feels rather like a New Testament passage. Remember, it's written to Jews, descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who had received the promises and the blessings of the covenant which God had given to them. Remember, it's also written to Jews whose ancestors had received the covenant, the second covenant, which had been established at the time of Moses, a covenant based on law. So why did they need another covenant? One here linked with the covenant promises of God given to King David. Well, the answer to all this, as you probably know, and indeed the answer to most Old Testament prophecy understanding, is Jesus. Because it is through Jesus that everything is fulfilled. The answer and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is almost always found in the Lord Jesus. It points to him. He is the descendant of King David who will sit on David's throne forever. That was the covenant that God gave to King David, a promise that one of his descendants would sit on his throne forever. And that is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus. 
He is the mediator of the new covenant, the one who stands between God and man to bring into action the new covenant, a covenant which ultimately was to be made through the shedding of his blood on the cross at Calvary. The Old Testament passage is an invitation to a New Testament relationship with the Lord God through his only begotten son, Jesus. Now, the covenant with Moses, of course, was a covenant based upon keeping the law. But the new covenant, just as the covenant given hundreds of years before the covenant to Moses to Abraham, was a covenant of grace. It was based upon God's promises, what he would do, and not upon what we had to do. It's available to those who have no money, who have nothing to offer for their salvation, because the price has already been paid, and it cost the Lord God the life of his son Jesus and the suffering of Calvary. Well, that's the Old Testament on the gospel message. But what does 2 Timothy passage have to say about this? If we look at verse 15 of chapter 3, we find that the Holy Scriptures are able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now remember that when Paul writes this, the New Testament scriptures are still in the process of being written. Paul will not have known at that time that his letters to churches and to individuals like Timothy would eventually come to be accepted as part of the Holy Scriptures. There are clues in the New Testament as was starting to happen. Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 16 refers to Paul's letters and he says they're really difficult to understand but he refers to them as scriptures because he refers to the Old Testament and possibly some of the New Testament writings as the other scriptures. So what I'm saying is that Paul in 2 Timothy is referring mainly to the Old Testament. So the Old Testament is able to make us wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That is the essence of the Christian gospel. Faith in Jesus saves us. It is all of God's grace. The other reference is in chapter 4, verse 5, where Timothy, the leader of a church, is told to do the work of an evangelist. The word evangelist is a quite interesting Greek word, or the equivalent Greek word is quite interesting. The eve part means good, and the second part sounds rather like angel. And it does sound like angel because it's the word for messenger. So it's do the work of a good messenger, one who brings the good message, the good news about the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word gospel, which we sometimes use, is an old English word which also means good news. Which brings me to the second main theme. When I was a young Christian, 50 years ago, I became a, a, a Christian 50 years ago when God intervened in my life with a very powerful experience of the Holy Spirit and completely turned me around more than 50 years ago. But I was told that the Lord God had made me and that the Bible was the equivalent of the maker's instructions as to how to live a good life. And you know, that's still true to this day. In the Isaiah passage, this second theme is not obvious, but there are a number of clues. Firstly, in verse 2, there's something about enjoying a good life in terms of food. Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest of fare. Then in verse 9, there's a statement that God's ways 
are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. In other words, he knows far better than us what is right and what is good for us. And finally, verses 10 and 11 speak of God's word that goes out of his mouth, being like the rain and the snow that comes down from heaven and waters the earth, causing plants to grow, providing seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So that word is powerful, and it will achieve the purpose for which God sent it. Now, for a Jew at the time of the prophet Isaiah, it was impossible to separate God's word from the Holy Scriptures, particularly from the first five books the, the, uh, of the, um, the Torah, of the first five books of the Old Testament law. And what did the Old Testament law tell you? It told you how to live and how to not live in order to please God and to live in close relationship with him. The Torah was for Jew, the maker's instructions. But 2 Timothy passage actually makes all this much clearer because Paul firstly reminds Timothy about how he had been brought up from infancy to know the Old Testament scriptures. Chapter 1, verse 5, Paul writes about the faith of Timothy's mother, Eunice, and grandmother, Lois. It was no doubt through them that Timothy was taught the Holy Scriptures. Now, I'm reminded that it has been said that one of the main reasons why the Christian faith survived in Russia through the long communist atheist years was the Russian grandmothers. The grandmothers who t passed on their faith to their grandchildren. Now, I know everything's not going right in Russia these days, but the faith was preserved in Russia through those dark atheistic times through grandmothers passing on their faith. So you and me, older folk, we've got a work to do in terms of sharing our faith with our children and our grandchildren and encouraging them just as Timothy was encouraged and taught by his mother and his grandmother. Verse 16 contains Paul's teaching about the divine inspiration of scripture and particularly, of course, we're still looking mainly at the Old Testament. All scripture is God-breathed. It's an interesting idea, isn't it? That God has breathed into it his word and his truth. Now, we need to understand that although some scripture is directly the words of God himself, God speaking to the prophet, the prophet faithfully conveying God's words, or we have God's words through the teaching of Jesus, with the words of Jesus being faithfully remembered and recorded by the apostles, or indeed conveyed to the gospel writers, like Luke, who went round talking to the people who'd known Jesus and finding out exactly what had happened. But most of scripture is not directly God's words. Most of scripture is the words of the writer themselves. And that's why it's important that we understand that they write with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But the Bible is a very complicated book. In fact, it's a library of different books. And there are all sorts of situations that arise. There are some situations, some parts of the Bible, um, particularly in Psalms and in books like Jeremiah, where the writer isn't actually saying what God is saying. He's simply expressing his own anger or frustration. He's being very human in talking about what, how he actually feels. Sometimes what comes out isn't actually very godly. It's not the thoughts or words of God. It's the thoughts and words of an angry, frustrated person. 
But nevertheless, it is there in Scripture, not as an example of how we should think, but to help us to understand that we are not alone when we are angry or frustrated, and that even the good believers of the past shared this experience. All scripture is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God and the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In other words, it is, as I've said before, the maker's instruction manual. Sometimes the teaching is in words, such as the Sermon on the Mount, or the teaching of Jesus, and sometimes it is a description of what happened, what Jesus did in particular, his miracles, the way he related to people. But of course the Bible is full of all sorts of, of, of people and situations. Sometimes what happens is very bad indeed, very bad behavior. There, the behavior is simply being described and not recommended, and sometimes it's been described as a warning as to how not to behave. So, understanding the scriptures is complicated, and we need to learn how to do that in, in the right way. Although we can speak of the scriptures, and we do, as being the word of God, the scriptures occasionally are not God's thoughts or words, or actions at all. They are a description of how people behaved in a particular time, whether that behavior was good or bad. And it takes discernment to tell when God is speaking and when the writer is sharing how he's feeling at the time. Yet through all of it, we can learn important lessons. Sometimes those lessons are how not to behave, Sometimes they are to reassure us that even the great believers of the past made terrible mistakes. And yet some, somehow the Lord God continued to forgive them and to use them despite those mistakes. That's always an encouragement to us. That's so in the New Testament as well. We see, we see the disciples just failing to understand what's happening or, or deserting Jesus in his time of need. And yet... The Lord restored them and used them in a powerful way. Now the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The first thing I need to say is that both the Old Testament and the New Testament are written about the same God. There is a heresy, and was a heresy, historically, that the Old Testament was somehow written about a different God, a more angry, vengeful God. Rubbish, utter nonsense. It's all about one God. Second thing is we need to understand there are powerful themes which run between both. And I've already mentioned the greatest theme of all, the theme of salvation by grace through faith. The Old Testament people were forgiven and accepted by the Lord God on the basis of their faith, beginning with the covenant which the Lord God made with Abraham. That faith covenant was based upon God's grace and Abraham's response of faith. He believed the Lord and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. And if you want to understand that better, that, that great theme running throughout, then look at what Paul writes in Galatians and Romans or what the writer of Hebrews has to say. The covenant of law which was given by Moses never superseded the covenant of grace. That's what Paul says plainly. The animal sacrifices were never effective in themselves, but they pointed forward to the one complete and sufficient sacrifice which was to come, which was the self-sacrifice of Jesus on the cross at Calvary. They were prophetic in the sense that they pointed forward to that great future event. The Old Testament law merely showed people how they should live and that a sacrifice was necessary in order to deal with the human sin problem. 
And that's why the writer to Hebrews writes that the great Old Testament saints did everything by faith and writes that, that we and they are to be made perfect together. Now, we're having studies at the moment on the book of Revelations, and the book of Revelations contains a lot of symbolic numbers. One of the symbolic numbers is the number 24. It keeps on coming up. 24. 12 tribes of Israel plus 12 apostles equals 24. 24 is the number of the Old Testament and the New Testament people together as one body of believers who are saved by God's mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ's death, by grace through faith. Now, a little time to speak about common misunderstandings of the scriptures, particularly of the Old Testament. I've already spoken of some. Firstly, there's a failure sometimes to understand that the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy is almost always going to be in the Lord Jesus. There are dear Christian people who think that God is going to turn the clock backwards and take us back into an Old Testament type of scenario so that all the Old Testament prophecy can be literally fulfilled. The late Clarence Schofield, I'm sure many of you remember Clarence, preached here for many years, lovely man. He taught me something helpful about that. He said that if he promised somebody a £10 note, but instead gave them a £50 note, then he had fulfilled his promise. So it is with the Old Testament. Jesus is the £50 note. God promises to the Old Testament people various things in Scripture, and he over-fulfills that promise in the Lord Jesus Christ. Doesn't give the £10 note, he gives the £50 note instead. And all of God's promises are going to be fulfilled much better in Jesus than the Old Testament promised. So these dear people who still want a literal £10 note when they already have a £50 note in Jesus. And a very quick example of that is those who think that the temple prophesied by Ezekiel will still be built as a third temple. But, Je but there was a third temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I'll build it again in three days. Jesus is the third temple. He was speaking of his own body. Jesus is the over-fulfillment of the prophecy of another temple. Secondly, I've already mentioned the misunderstanding that people have that God's plan of salvation was always the same by grace through faith. Certainly, sometimes there's a failure to understand reading the scriptures when God is speaking and when it's a very human voice speaking in anger or frustration. One could ask oneself a simple question. Would Jesus have wanted this or done this or said this? Fourthly, there's a failure sometimes to understand passages in their historical context. You see, in the Old Testament in particular, God doesn't speak in a vacuum. He speaks in a historical context of the time. So we have need to ask ourselves, what is happening? And what is God saying? And what does it mean? As a young Christian, I remember the phrase, the joy of the Lord is our strength, being applied as if it were a New Testament statement. Which is great, great, isn't it? The joy of the Lord is our strength. Well, hey. <laughs> but the context of the verse was the deep repentance of the people of God when at the time of Ezra, the priest, they found that they had not been keeping God's commandments for many years. They were broken and in tears. And the priest Ezra is seeking to reassure them that they are still loved and valued by God who will forgive them and fill them with joy because of their genuine repentance. So we need to understand the Old Testament in its context. What's it saying? What's God doing to fully understand it? 
actually, we do that first of all, and then the second stage is we then say, yes, but how is this fulfilled in the New Testament? That's how, what it meant to them in the Old Testament, but how is this fulfilled or over-fulfilled in Jesus in the New Testament? So briefly, what can we learn from this morning? Firstly, the Bible is God's word to us. It is reliable, and it teaches us everything which we need to know for salvation and for living a good Christian life. Secondly, that we have an important role in teaching our children and our grandchildren or other younger relatives in faithfully passing on the faith to another generation. Thirdly, that we need to learn how to understand the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, the context. What sort of writing is it? Is it poetry? Is it, is it, uh, is it wise sayings? Uh, is it prophecy? Is it history? What is it? And having understood it in its original terms, we need to then seek to understand what it means for us in New Testament terms. To do this, we're going to have to work at it, to invest time in reading and studying it in order to understand it. Fourthly and finally, we need to remember that God always had only one plan of salvation for everybody. That was fulfilled in his son Jesus coming to earth and teaching and healing and suffering and dying. The Old Testament prepares us for that great event. And Old Testament prophecy points forward to complete fulfillment of that, in that great event. And finally, in the eventual return of Jesus to judge and to rule and to reign in the heavenly kingdom forever. I'm going to close with brief words of scripture taken from Psalm 119, which will be very familiar to you. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Amen.